All right. Since we have now reached about 15 minutes past the hour, I think we're going to go ahead and get started so that we have enough time for everything we've planned today. I think we may have additional uh, participants joining us throughout the next hour or so. Um, but let me welcome everyone. My name is Claire Stewart. I'm the Dean of Libraries at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and I would like to welcome everyone to the Humanities panel, where we're going to be discussing open publishing and open scholarship in the Big Ten. I'd like to start with a welcome to our panelists, who are all faculty from Big Ten campuses who actively use open channels for their publications and are active in conversations about open publishing and open scholarship in their disciplines or on their campuses. I'm going to briefly introduce each of them um, and then to start off the discussion, our panelists are going to be giving short, uh, short introductions of themselves, brief remarks, and giving a thumbnail sketch of, from their perspective on the topic today, so that you have an idea of who's on our panel and why they're here. So joining us today will be Harmony Bench, Associate Professor, Department of Dance at The Ohio State University, Holly Brewer, the Burke Professor of American History at the University of Maryland, TJ Billard, Assistant Professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University, and Josephine Lee, Professor of English and Asian American Studies at the University of Minnesota. So I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts from my perspective, some of the things that I have been thinking of when I consider this topic. Um, I am, um, in my role as Dean of Libraries at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln have the good fortune of co-sponsoring with my colleague, Mark Button, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities, which has a very long history of open scholarship, including building some very large projects such as the Whitman Archive and the Cather Archive that have really become established as new national infrastructure for the humanities. And at this moment in time, I'm serving um, in a couple of other capacities on projects and initiatives that I, I think are really also being profoundly shaped by this broad conversation about open access and open scholarship in the humanities. So that includes this year, I'm chair of the Board of Governors for Hathi Trust. I'm serving on an ACLS commission around uh, sustaining diverse digital scholarship um, and, and other things, including obviously the, the big collection project within the Big Ten. So I, over the weekend, I was catching up on some conversations around chat GPD, chat GPT, um, including a really interesting episode of Ezra Klein's podcast that was centering on the debates in the artificial intelligence field itself, and specifically whether the type of artificial intelligence that GPT is, which is basically a deep learning machine, is ever actually going to solve what they call the truth problem. The GPT is an, an, an uncannily effective mimic or what the panelist Gary Marcus called a pastiche machine. And it has the effect of driving the cost of generating very credible sounding misinformation at scale to near zero but in fact is doing a remarkably bad job at getting better at actually discerning the truth. So one of the things that has always stood out to me as I think about open science and open scholarship, and, and for that matter, the content in our libraries that we're digitizing are the consequences of what is actually available openly and in full text, and what the impact is that on the broader societal discourse but of course that also has an impact on what's available to things like deep learning machines. And I think a, a key question, of course, in a setting like that, among many others, is what is knowledge? Our, our concept of knowledge itself is rapidly evolving and changing as it should. Um, and so I think all of those things really do come together in an interesting way when we think about open scholarship in humanities. Uh, and in particular, I think, um, you know, from a financial perspective, what does it mean or what should it mean in terms of the role of the university? And of course, my interest is what is the role of the library in a future like this? Uh, to, so to put it a different way and maybe a little more bluntly, um, if we are looking at a future in which collections really don't look anything like they have in the past, 
Um, should we be continuing to pour millions of dollars into the same systems and structures that we have? Um, so, it, and if you might uh, guess, you know, from the way I've phrased that qu question, if we do not think things are going to look the way they have in the past, then what is the change that we should be creating now? From promotion and tenure systems, so to how universities should view our presses, to how we invest in humanities research, in particular when so many of those collaborations are going to be, are and will be in the future taking place with partners outside of the academy. So those are just some of the things that rattle around in my brain um, as I think about openness in the humanities. Um, let me hand things over to Harmony. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I'm loving actually where this conversation is starting uh, because it's I, I totally did not think that chat GPT was going to figure in today's conversation, but here we are and I'm ready for it. Um, so I'm delighted to be participating on today's panel. I'm Harmony Bench. I'm associate professor in the Department of Dance at The Ohio State University. And my research focuses on dance on screen, the digital humanities and digital cultural practices. Um, from 2014 to 2019, I uh, co-edited an open access journal, the International Journal of Screen Dance, which is supported by the libraries at Ohio State. So going back to the infrastructure Claire was just talking about. Uh, I was also awarded a Tome open access grant for my first book, Perpetual Motion, Dance, Digital Cultures and the Common, which was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2020. And I've also been publishing open access in more traditional journals in my discipline, uh, in part because of mandates from funders. So I've seen open access publishing from a few different angles, and I'm, I'm excited to, I'm excited to um, feed into today's conversation. By way of sharing some initial thoughts, I, I really want to acknowledge that in the arts and humanities, there can be some really interesting superstitions around open access publishing, and that these superstitions actually have really significant follow-on implications for early career researchers. Um, for example, a book reviews editor for a theater studies journal recently told me that some scholars will flat out just refuse to review books for journals and awards committees if they're not provided in hard copy. So there are some important differences of opinion about not only how scholarship should circulate, whether it should arrive with you know, monetary or non-monetary costs for the reader, but also the medium in which it should arrive, uh, print or digital, uh, seeing those as mutually exclusive, even though they certainly are not. And that means I, I think that especially junior faculty are gonna be making choices uh, for how they um, publish their work, not on the basis of what their research needs or even what will best serve them in their long-term career, but in the short term based on what evaluators demand of them. So I think that there really needs to be a shift um, there as we're kind of thinking about possibilities. For myself in choosing open access um, for my book, uh, it was published both print and digital. Uh, and there were a few considerations for me. One was uh, the actual topic of my book, which addresses how dance circulates through digital spaces, um, namely through social media. So I wanted it to be available without any kind of a paywall um, because I was analyzing practices that circulate free freely. I also wanted my um, contribution to circulate freely through the same kinds of spaces um, and at no cost. The second thing for me was, I don't know if your students are anything like mine, but my students are very reluctant to spend money on books for coursework. And so publishing open access meant that I knew um, a, a text would be much easier to assign. Um, not, not for me, for my colleagues to assign. I don't typically assign my own work, but you know, that's also a thing. Um, and then along with that is, is just being able to acknowledge that way more people have uh, downloaded the open access version of the book than there are members of my professional organization. So that tells me that publishing open access has helped to get the book into the hands of readers outside of my particular field and also increased its international reach. So all of those things are really um, important for me and important for uh, this conversation around open access uh, publishing. As I mentioned, I also co-edited an open access journal and have been working under mandates that uh, require publication of, of materials open access. And so I wanted to also just throw in a couple of things based on uh, these experiences because we're gathered uh, as the Big Ten <laughs> Academic Alliance. Um, and one is the, about the cost of research dissemination. During some lean years at Ohio State, I had a colleague um, who was working in a field where 
publication fees were the norm and he just stopped publishing um, because the out-of-pocket expenses were uh, more than the merit increase that he would have gotten in a salary uh, to reward that publication. So to me, that's like, that's not the right answer. Uh, he was also a full professor, so like he could afford, he could choose uh, to do that. Um, but what that shows me is the incredible uh, individual, the, the, the burden of um, publication costs are, are, the burdens are borne individually and we have an opportunity to see where we can uh, come together as a community and as a collective. Um, and then as I've been working on grant funded projects, there's often this requirement to publish open access um, with a caveat that you can't use the grant funds for it. So again, it's kind of offloading this requirement onto the individual without necessarily the, the individual being able to access uh, funds or that being uh, variable by department or by university or um, by institution. Another thing is the labor of sustaining open access. Um, the journal that I co-edited, you know, we didn't charge anything. There were no publication fees, no submission fees, no access fees. And this is really important because our primary audience um, uh, was, was artists, independent artists, and they don't make a lot of money. Um, and so like who's the audience has a, has a clear uh, factor in terms of how we're thinking about um, uh, open access. But again, it was only available because of the university in infrastructure that I had access to, and also because I could absorb the labor of layout and formatting and copy editing on all of the things that typically would be compensated labor, but it had to be all volunteer. Um, so that really, I, I just wanna kind of foreground like what is an opportunity to work together as an alliance um, and the possibility of leveraging our, our numbers together rather than offloading, um, uh, navigating this uh, uh, publication landscape onto uh, us as individual researchers. Thank you so much, Harmony. Holly, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Holly Brewer. I'm, uh, I'm a historian at the University of Maryland College Park and I first became involved in open access issues because I was keenly aware of the diminishing ability of our libraries to purchase both monographs and databases uh, because of spiraling open access costs related to journals in particular. And in my field, there have been just um, a burgeoning of incredible databases that when we can afford to buy them, enable just fantastic research opportunities, but they cost a lot of money. Um, and these are everything from um, ProQuest uh, databases of newspapers published in the United States, um, which there's now on the sort of 16th series, each one of which cost my library some, I don't know, $100,000. And we were able to purchase the first three, that's before journal costs kept, you know, spiraled out of control. And we haven't purchased any since. Um, and, but beyond this um, early, there are other major databases, which, you know, keep being added to of now with scanning ability that can be scanned in that we could, we might be able to afford to purchase and they cost a lot of money, but we have no money to do that or almost none because everything's being taken up by journals. It's from what um, I understand it, 97% of our library acquisition budget is now taken up um, by, by journal subscriptions. And, um, and likewise, the number of books that my library is able to purchase has gone down, the number of you know, monographs. In my field of history, those are the crucial way we share information. And yes, I can get these books on interlibrary loan or some other way, but in terms of the, my, the ability of, of me and my colleagues, my own ability to do research, the ability of, for me as a dissertation advisor to help my graduate students get access to materials, the ability of me as a, um, a teacher of undergraduate research classes to get my students access to databases, the cutting edge databases, the, the databases that allow them to going, going to allow them to do cutting edge research, that has um, all been going down even as these databases are becoming um, more and more pervasive and more and more essential for that research. So. So I therefore started really focusing on this, this question of, of spiraling costs. Um, but I also became increasingly aware that um, when I myself published work that I had worked on for a long time and that 
is written in a way that's a broader public interest and people might be interested in, and that's one of words, even in um, me publishing in mainstream journals, like for me, the American Historical Review, I published an article in 2017, and initially, at least, um, it was Oxford University Press was charging $48 for anyone who wanted to just read the article, and this has to do with slavery and democracy and the big questions of American history. And it won an award and they make it made it open access for a, one, a month during which it kind of like, you know, took off in terms of the number of readers. Um, and, and amazingly, and I don't know quite why they did this, maybe because I was complaining so much about a year and a half ago after I talked about it in a, um, a lecture I gave for the AP organization. I was lecturing, giving one of the big lectures. Um, Oxford University Press just took the lid off and made it open access and it's now been downloaded something like 23,000 times. So, um, but imagine that it was costing $48 just to access that article. And if people, if you're in the know, you know you can go around that, you can sign up for JSTOR, you can get access to a number of articles via JSTOR. JSTOR has been, you know, really amazing at creating broader access. But if you don't know, you're looking at that that price tag, and I was getting emails from people saying, please, can you share your article because I can't afford to pay for it. And so that is, you know, the, there's sort of two sides um, that this has really been impacting me as a historian and a scholar. And, um, and I want to, I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later in terms of one of the questions, but this, if we, if these, these kinds of feeds are making it so that the work that scholars do at is is inaccessible and in terms of the issues that Claire was raising at the beginning about <laughs> big data ad aggregators um, and and disinformation and the truth problem if academics aren't part of the public conversation if we're being siloed into a different category that's actually you know not that's actually um, a huge problem for the public conversation in the United States um, and the last thing I want to mention just really briefly is the other, and, and this is related to the databases. So a lot of these databases that cause that costs a lot of money, um, it's because it of course it costs a lot of money to scan in a lot of records. So the National Archives in the UK has allowed private firms to scan in a lot of their really crucial records. Um, because they can't afford to do it and to make it free. Um, but it means that if people can't afford, it means that only a certain very limited number of people have access to those things. And what um, I've been trying to do because I've used those records a lot and I, I got funding from the um, NHPRC, the National Historic Publications and Records Commission to, to take um, some of the database, some of the data, some of the images from the National Archives and, and other sources that relate to slavery, law, and power, which is the, the, the thematic organizational structure I've been putting it under, um, to, to a sort of create access to those documents so people who are outside of these limited groups can get access to some of that data. So the other problem, it seems to me, in a world where there's so much misinformation is how do we get access to people, provide access to people, not just um, scholars, but members of the general public who want to see the sources on which they can make judgments. How do we provide that access? So one of my other efforts in terms of open access is figuring out how to take the original images often of manuscripts, transcribe them, provide introductions and, and help orient people so that they can have access to some of the materials that otherwise they wouldn't see that are behind the paywall. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Uh, TJ, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is TJ Billard. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication and the Department of Sociology at Northwestern. Um, and my research focuses on media and transgender politics, looking at things like um, social movement communication strategy and also misinformation as there is rampant misinformation about trans people uh, circulating in contemporary media and politics so sticking on a theme uh, for the morning. Um, I'm also, uh, in addition to being a uh, faculty at Northwestern, I'm the executive director of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies uh, called CATS for short, and yes, that was on purpose. 
Um, and CATS is an independent nonprofit research organization that is dedicated to scholarship on the social, cultural, and political conditions of transgender life. Uh, we were launched uh, here in Chicago in March of 2021, uh, and we consist of about 40 of the world's leading transgender scholars um, working in six different countries and on three different continents, um, and at several of the world's premier institutions, uh, including top universities, but also nonprofit research institutes uh, and other uh, groups like that. Um, as an organization, uh, we are an organization of scholars for scholars, but we believe that dedication to public service and a commitment to justice should be at the heart of academic inquiry. And of course, we also believe that education should not only occur in classrooms. And so guided by those beliefs, uh, the organization's work focuses on facilitating and promoting the study of transgender issues with the ultimate aim of informing policymaking and public discourse in ways that uh, improve quality of life for trans people. And so that work entails things like speaking to journalists that we do often, working directly with policymakers uh, to advise on policy proposals, um, both uh, here in Illinois, but also uh, federally. Uh, we work with coalition partners. Um, but at the end of the day, we're also still academics, uh, and we also care about the production of academic research. And so one of the things that was crucial when uh, we launched the organization was we knew that we wanted a journal. Um, and the reason why, in large part, we wanted a journal was because of how small, uh, but also how closed the publishing space is for trans studies. Uh, there are uh, other than uh, the journal that we launched that I'll talk about in a second, there were three journals in transgender studies, uh, one of which Transgender Studies Quarterly, published by Duke University Press, uh, closed access, and then two health journals, Transgender Health and the International Journal of Transgender Health, uh, both uh, closed access and kind of dominated by clinicians. And so this desire um, for a journal came out of that lack there and uh, our mission of having impact publicly, right? Um, we wanted uh, open access to be something uh, that existed in the trans study space so that um, when policymakers are making policy, the correct information is available. Um, we wanted to um, serve to the trans communities that this nonprofit organization is meant to serve um, by making the work that we did uh, in their name and in their benefit available to them. Um, and so we had this idea of a journal. We wanted it to be open access. We also knew, kind of going to Harmony's point earlier, that there are tiers of open access, right? There are uh, varying degrees to which there are costs to um, different people, and we wanted there to not be cost both to the readers, but also to our prospective authors uh, who, um, you know, often will be precarious in the academy uh, and other things. And so uh, I approached Northwestern University Libraries about the idea of a journal just in the abstract. Uh, Northwestern University Libraries had not published a journal yet, but they were uh, excited by the idea. And so over the course of 2021, uh, we went through a process of discussion about the idea, coming up with a formal pitch for the journal, going through the contract negotiations between the center and the university libraries, licensing agreements, and all of these different things, um, to eventually launch the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies, uh, of which I'm now editor in chief. And so through this whole process, I've, I've uh, gained a lot of experience as, as the libraries um, in you know, navigating the growth pains of a, a new journal and a new open access journal. Um, you know, that those have included things, you know, ranging from setting up the journal technically uh, through to like the legalese that thankfully I don't have to deal with because the libraries does. Um, and then over the last year of 2022, we published our first volume. And so my contributions to this conversation really come first from this um, journal perspective, um, but also from my perspective of a, a focus on public scholarship and rethinking the role of the scholar, of scholarly institutions, and of journals in society. Um, I, I come at this uh, with the sometimes radical, sometimes not radical, depending on the audience I'm talking to, um, position of wanting to rethink not only how we publish, but also why we publish, who our audiences are, and what would it take for us 
uh, as academics and as academic institutions to reorient the purpose of the journal um, in more expansive ways. And so I'm um, really excited to be able to kind of talk uh, across these different um, threads uh, today um, because I think one of the, the key um, tensions that underlies all of what we're doing here is this question of why are we doing it um, and um, in contemporary society as in different ways uh, Harmony and Holly have both hinted at we, we need to think about um, think more seriously about what the role of the university is and what our role is in the wider society in which we are embedded and not just focus on open access as like a inside baseball of you know academic um you know cultures uh, if that makes sense thank you thank you tj josephine Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Josephine Lee. I'm an, a professor of English and Asian American Studies at the University of Minnesota. And right now, I'm also the Associate Dean for Arts and Humanities at the U. Um, I am really excited about this conversation, so I'll just keep my remarks kind of brief. Um, I wanted to mention that I come to this out of my own research. I'm a brand new open access author, although I've offered other books. Uh, recently in November, University of North Carolina Press published my first open access book, um, which I was very excited about um, because I've long been a fan of open access, both for scholarship, my own scholarship, and for teaching access. Um, I also am the editor-in-chief of a project we did two years ago uh, for Oxford University Press, um, which was the Encyclopedia of Asian American Literature and Culture, and we had about 101 essays, uh, full-length essays, and we managed to get Oxford to agree to allow 15 of them to be open access, to have free access. Um, not all of them, they weren't willing to go with all, but, but we got 15 out of them that are open, uh, and we were very pleased with that. So I'm mostly happy with open access, you know, in terms of my own scholarship and my uh, teaching. Uh, I think it's a wonderful way in which uh, we should all be sort of thinking of a way forward. And I'm particularly grateful that my libraries are very active in promoting uh, open access and thinking about these questions. I think it's particularly compelling in areas that I work in, which is uh, my book was on the formation of uh, race uh, and images in uh, racial habits in American theater in the 19th and early 20th century, um, particularly uh, images of uh, blackness and Orientalism combined. Um, and I was really happy to do that project in open access because I hope to um, integrate it uh, with projects, uh, more digitally based projects. And so I think open access is particularly fitting for those of us who work in kind of performing arts or visual arts in which print does limit the amount of uh, material you can circulate, um, you know, and I think certainly for my colleagues who are working with um, research, social science research, for instance, on populations that they want to be reading their books, right? Open access makes a lot of sense. So I really take, you know, what Harmony had said earlier about, you know, dance, wanting uh, a book on dance or a project on dance to actually be read by the artists um, themselves. And I feel that way about my work as well. Um, I'm also a former advisory board member for U of M Press, um, so go Minnesota. Uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful press and they've tried to do a lot with open access. And through them, I wound up on, uh, we have a grant program for the Towards an Open Monograph ecosystem, the Tome Grants um, that I've been an, uh, an awards member. We helped to subsidize uh, open access monographs. And because I'm currently the Associate Dean for Arts and Humanities, I've remained on that. And I'm really happy to talk about some of the questions that people raise, both about the fiscal implications. I know that Holly had talked about um, the spiraling costs and the particularly the cost of digitization, which I think does affect all of us. I'm also really excited to talk about how open access impacts in sort of 
more local ways, um, faculty careers and faculty decisions. And I hear what Harmony is saying about, you know, when you start to develop open access projects that make their way in, you have to develop basically self-publishing skills, right? And, and so you become responsible for a lot of labor that people uh, did for you when you're pu publishing in more traditional print venues. And I'm also um, interested in what TJ was saying about how to encourage new areas of research that don't fit into established journals. And, and I think in some ways, this is not just a question of open access uh, through making materials available to um, uh, more scholars and more students, but how to get more people thinking about certain areas of scholarship that have not been welcome in the academy before. So I'll just stop there. I know we have a lot to talk about. Thank you so much, Josephine, and thank you to all our panelists, almost perfectly on time. And it was really wonderful to hear you um, talk about your research. And I think we've had some very rich topics come to the fore here. Um, we, are, we are now gonna turn to having a little conversation among the panelists. As we're talking, I would invite those of you who are with us today to contribute additional questions, comments, ideas. Um, there is a Q&A box. If you haven't opened that up, this would be a good time to do that. Moderators are in the background and are going to be collecting questions and comments, and I'll be incorporating them into the conversation as we go. So we have a lot of people here today. You may or may not hear your question read out word for word, but be assured we're carefully recording and saving every one of them. So the purpose of the discussion today is to bring together our campus communities, libraries and faculty, and join ideas from every person about how we can collectively advance open publishing and open scholarship across the Big Ten. So this is a really complex topic, as you've already heard. There are many rich perspectives and many viable and practical approaches for how to keep advancing along this path. We'll, by necessity, only be able to touch on a few of them today, but after this session, we'll open up an online discussion forum well, where you'll be able to continue to add your ideas and build on the ideas of others over a period of time. So the, the things that we talk about today in this forum are going to help seed that and build a knowledge bank for community thinking and conversation, um, which will be, become part of our collective thinking and action in this space and will really be important to shaping future direction for the, the big collection project. So we'll tell you more about how that will happen at the end of the session. But let's go ahead and um, start off the conversation with our panelists. And I, I'll, I would just throw out the first question, which is um, what kind of impact do you think open access is having in the publishing and research space? And what does the shift look like from traditional publishing to the open access model? Um, so I'll start, I think maybe I'm being a little optimistic here, but I do think that there is some kind of disruption to the business as usual of our fields, because I do think that, um, you know, open access offers advantages to authors over traditional publishing, especially um, if those authors are ones who come with certain mandates to their work, as, as I do, as, as Harmony talked about doing, where, you know, we're dedicated for political reasons or for community reasons um, to that kind of openness. And I think that as more true open access venues become available as, as we kind of see um, happening across a number of fields, they often are very quick to become popular and it will be really increasingly difficult for a lot of closed access venues to continue to justify their closeness, um, especially as authors have concerns that are even more pragmatic, like I want my work read more so it can be cited more. Um, and so um, I think that that will be happening. And we're seeing that to a certain degree with professional societies. Uh, for the International Communication Association is the one that's most central to my kind of uh, daily uh, profession. And our uh, professional society is having major discussions with Oxford, who publishes our core journals about like what can we do to increase the openness uh, of what we publish and so especially as professional societies get involved in those conversations i think we'll start seeing the needle move more i will say from my experiences editing the bulletin of applied trans studies i do think that there is a major issue to be dealt with uh, and there are many ways to maybe deal with this 
but that is like a kind of reputation gap that often affects open access journals, um, especially when those journals are published independently or more, more kind of like upstart um, initiatives. Um, so, like I said earlier, in the trans studies space, TSQ is Duke, which is uh, great and comes a, a, along with a very rich history of what Duke publishes. Um, but that's, uh, on the other hand, is the only Northwestern University Library Journal to exist, and it is new. And Northwestern, though a great university, is a new entrant into the open access journal space. And so um, we need to kind of work diligently at BATS to build up that reputation and to bring on scholars who are willing to invest their work and their reputations in this upstart journal, which means, you know, uh, particularly for early career scholars on, on a tenure track uh, or who are trying to get on a tenure track, they might not be willing to make that investment as, as often uh, because they need these kind of reputation markers, right? Um, and this isn't universally an issue, right? There are places like MIT with sterling reputations that are doing good work in open access publishing, but that's not necessarily the majority um, of the uh, open access journals in, in the publishing space. So uh, I wanted to add to this and re-emphasize in stronger terms some of what I said at the beginning, and that is that it's crucial that academic faculty be able to engage with the broader public on important questions. Um, if our work is behind extensive paywalls, we cannot do it, or it's much more difficult. People can't find what we're doing, and particularly they can't see our evidence and our footnotes and why we came to our conclusions. Like we can write an op-ed in a newspaper, we might get a few highlights out, but if the general public can't read the research on which it's based, that's a huge problem. And I think this is especially true for those of us who teach at public, you know, at public institutions and or receive public funding for our scholarship. The, um, the general public is paying for us. And although obviously our primary responsibility is to teach the students in our classrooms, they should have access to the work that we're producing. <laughs> And to me, this is just a straightforward position. And if they can't do that, they don't see the reason to support public universities. And so I actually think there's a link between declining public support for universities and the fact that people can't read our scholarship or it's much more difficult. Um, I, um, anyway, um, and, and I also wanna say this, and I think it's really important. Um, Obviously, there are authors, academic authors can get um, some money from, from copywriting shared work, you know, books or whatever, uh, a small amount. But for us, it's usually a very small amount of money. We get paid nothing from journals. The reason that the journals are so expensive and that they're, um, they're consumed, the cost for them is consuming so much of library budgets has to do with profiteering by publishers, many of them for-profit companies who have taking advantage of powerful copyright rules. Um, and they are making the profits and not the authors. And I wanted to say this really briefly because I was utter, utterly fascinated by it. I had a conversation recently with someone who was the chief of staff for the main person in the House of Representatives who was working on copyright rules in the 1980s, 1990s and through the, the aughts. And, um, and, I don't know if any of us have done enough serious thinking about the details of the copyright rules that were written at that point and how they allow the kind of profiteering that we're now seeing. But I think probably we should be made, paying more attention. Um, and I also wanna just say, um, lastly, it's also crucial that our that students have access to these sources. So even more than the general public. And um, at a lot of the public institutions in, in Maryland and public universities in Maryland, they do not have as much library, as big library budgets as we do. And there's a lot of things that students cannot get access to that are academic. Um, so this is, this is a, these are huge issues. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Holly, TJ. Those are both really, I think, interesting comments. Let me throw out another question. And I and I'm glad to see there are some really interesting questions coming in the Q&A too. So panelists definitely feel free to pick up on anything you're seeing there. But um, okay, this has already come up a couple of times. The, uh, many misconceptions about open access exist. 
For example, that Creative Commons licenses might enable, enable plagiarism or that OA publishing always requires an author payment or that OA is synonymous with or rife with predatory publishing, which can con convert into a lot of fears about rights, whether authors are giving up their rights, having rights um, contorted and, and preyed upon. Um, could you, any of you speak to your own experiences in this area and what you've perceived or what you've heard? Just Fina, I know you said you, things that you've been hearing from other scholars. What are you hearing and what would you say to the folks who are on the fence or skeptical? Yeah, I, I will definitely want to say something about uh, as someone who's a fairly new open access uh, monograph author, um, I've been talking to a number of my colleagues who are uh, my generation, right, um, which is this generation that may have published their first books in um, traditional print form, or most of whom have published uh, their print books in traditional uh, form uh, and are just now coming into the open access field. You know, what would be the advantages to doing that? And I think there are a number of misconceptions and their responses that I've had from colleagues uh, hasn't been totally enthusiastic. I've heard from people who are worried about things like royalties and uh, copyright, in other words, ownership and compensation of their own work. Um, I would say that those worries are not really well-founded. I'm a fairly new open access monograph author, but uh, the amount I've received in royalties it generally from academic books is not so high that you know, there's an issue there. Um, I think there's also some work worries about uh, plagiarism. And I would say as someone who's had my my print work plagiarized, uh, I would say that it might be actually easier to prove uh, plagiarism from open access sources because it's right out there. Um, I wanted to add something that I was thinking about, though, uh, when Holly and TJ were speaking. I mean, Holly's comment that uh, as uh, scholars who work in um, public universities, right? we do have a, a kind of uh, obligation to think about who is paying for our scholarship, right? If the general public is uh, state of Minnesota, for instance, is helping to pay my salary, they are paying for us. But I think it also runs into the question uh, that TJ brought up with uh, about the reputation gap for some of these pub publications, um, particularly uh, smaller journal publications, ones that are not considered in the top tier journals, perhaps on someone uh, promotion and tenure reviews. Um, I mean, there's a very real question between who's paying for us and who's reviewing us, right? What, what do the fields look like? So I would say one of the things uh, to focus on is how to create a sense of um, importance and prestige for the work that we are publishing through open access, right? That that there is this kind of way in which we're in control or we being academics ourselves on how, how enthusiastic we are about this work, right? Um, and we can drive a lot of attention to it um, and not just turn to it. In some ways, the argument is about how convenient it is, right? For open access, but we can say, you know, that it is really wonderful. It's a added plus, added value to the scholarship to be open to access. Um, as someone who served on our awards committee for our tome grants, our towards an open monograph uh, grants, um, I, I think it's a big deal to get that award, right? It is not just something that makes the, again, the scholarship more convenient, but it's actually an awards process that recognizes the special value of this work. Um, and I do know that NEH and other fellowship agencies um, have monies available for digital access. You know, I, I, I know that NEH fellowships have an extra pot of money. I think it would be important um, to, to sort of bake it into academic publishing in a way. I mean, not just treat it as a special case, um, and also for university presses to um, build a kind of clear pathway um, to make it known to their authors that this is a, you know, something that doesn't necessarily require a subvention um, from the author themselves. You know, again, I think very few authors would choose to publish in a format that would 
um, make it really difficult financially for them. And I know we don't, in a public university at least, we can't pay our faculty enough so that they're shelling out all this extra money, right, to get just to get their work published. Um, so I'll just stop there. I mean, I would say I'm going to slightly repeat myself because um, I'm apparently one of those dolls that you just pull the string and I just say the same thing over and over again. But I um, want to kind of pick up on what uh, Joe was saying, because I do think a large part of this is that universities and professional societies have a really important role to play, not only in overcoming misconceptions, which they can do in a variety of ways, but also in supporting and prioritizing open access publication as a benefit of our scholarship in general, right? And, and that requires us to shift how we view open access as being part of what our mission of scholarship is, right? Why are we producing that knowledge? Who are we producing it for? Who's paying us? Um, and as universities look to make ourselves more relevant to contemporary society, which we can kind of see all the myriad ways that that, that, that is maybe slipping away from us, um, open scholarship provides a path for orienting ourselves outward to the world um, and, and, and not just like proving our worth, but actually earning our worth um, to our society. And so how can we contribute to this increased understanding to potential solutions to the problems facing the world? And that goes for our professional societies too, to the extent that they kind of shepherd the significance of our fields, right? Um, and so as professional societies go about, um, uh, you know, thinking about what is the role of why we publish our journals? Is it for the uh, investments in knowledge or is it, you know, as often as the case, it's actually where most of our money comes from and it's not the membership fees, it's this deal we have with X um, for-profit or nonprofit publisher. And so professional societies have an important role um, in thinking through what do we want you know, X field to do, who do we want X field to be talking to, what do we want the publications in this field uh, to be for, um, and, and uh, that um, will require a lot of like internal conversations, kind of grassroots across our fields as memberships start coming together and saying, no, this is what we want, this is how we prioritize uh, open access and, and that kind of plays into things like the reputation gap, because if we are collectively deciding that we value as a professional society open access, then open access doesn't suffer from a bad reputation, right? Um, and so there's a lot of almost like an internal social movement kind of thing that needs to happen, I think, to, to change that and in doing so, you know, there wouldn't really be the capacity for those misconceptions anymore because we've all done it together. I'd love to to hop in on this topic and also bring in the um, from the the Q and A some of the questions about machine learning and advancements in AI, which I think you know I think we're we're absolutely right about the possibilities of open access and that open access is good, um, but I think that we can be a little bit naive about some of the consequence. Like we don't necessarily think all the way through. I think it was Josephine who was earlier saying that we need to get a little bit more knowledgeable about some of the copyright uh, kinds of considerations. And, um, but I also think that we need to, you know, as, as um, ChatGPT or Dolly or whatever these uh, platforms are, are taking off, I think we also shouldn't um, be naive and think that these are only scraping from open access materials. They're not. They're scraping from um, privately held databases. They're scraping from uh, materials that people have access to because of their affiliations with, with corporations that are um, compiling data. And so I, I think that there's um, a potential for the open access and the, the um, uh, machine learning artificial intelligence conversation to kind of overlap and, and converge in, in ways I think that we should be aware of and savvy about, but also not thinking that open access fuels or um, becomes the the on, the only fodder for these um, uh, learning algorithms um, because I, I think that that's really just not the case. You know, these these are set up to feed on all uh, all knowledge production, and so I actually think there's an opportunity there uh, to to gather, God forbid, artists, scientists, humanists, ethicists, engineers to actually have those conversations about 
um, what does reuse look like? Because publishing open access doesn't actually mean um, that it becomes the, uh, a common pool resource. And, and making things av available on the internet doesn't mean that you're contributing to a common pool resource. Um, and we, we know that things that are being scraped include uh, copyright protected materials. So, but there's also a part of me that's like, how precious do we need to be? You know, if we want open access, well, then one of those things is that you're gonna get scraped and you're gonna be part of a bot. Um, and, and what is it about academic publishing and our, our criteria for evaluation um, that makes us feel anxiety around that? I mean, hey, may, maybe, you know, my next evaluation, I'll be like, I got scraped by a bot, you know, give me the next promotion level. I'm going to totally add that into the conversation about what impact means, which I think is a really great topic that you raised, TJ, TJ is that we're redefining what impact uh, research, humanities research impact means. Um, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, keep us moving along to another question um, uh, and just ask uh, the panelists to, to talk about what are the barriers or challenges in the open access space that you're seeing on your campus or in your discipline and how do you think this translates to the broader, the broader publishing space in the academy? How do we uh, lower those barriers? How do we make open access publishing as easy as possible? So I'm gonna jump in here and I, I want to point, especially in humanities, the costs of publishing and editing are, are often um, quite substantial. And especially if you're gonna do a great job and check all the, the citations, et cetera. And disciplinary societies have traditionally used um, the fees that they get from journal costs to pay for both the publishing costs and for um, such expenditures, including this, the editorial staff for newspapers. And um, so the, there's really big questions especially from the perspective of the disciplinary societies that have long, you know, for a hundred years, structured much of the academy about how they're going to replace those costs that have been so fundamental to keep their organizations going and that have extended into these questions of editing and publishing costs. Um, and the, this, this, the, sec, the um, parallel concern is reimbursement repay and repayment of effort for scholarly work, um, which is the traditional reason for copyright. I don't think that's as important for people in the academy who are literally within the academy because they're already being paid a salary, but it is still an issue and it's especially an issue for people who are not technically in the academy. And so I think we need to um, think very, very carefully about what the current rules are about intellectual copyright and also how to include the, the disciplinary societies and these questions of publishing costs within our conversation. And last, I would just briefly point out something that's come up already is that there are quality concerns. If we in fact just try to ignore the traditional journals and go elsewhere and ignore the societies, we, we have serious concerns about quality that we need to, that I, that I think are um, super important. Yeah, um, echoing the the quality concerns, the reputation gap. Um, I don't feel like I need to speak any more to that. But what I will kind of wave a little flag for is um, something that I see as a as a challenge or a barrier is is what I'll just gloss as equal access to open access. So a lot of us are coming from uh, well resourced uh, places um, such that we have available to us, uh, and I think one of the uh, Q and A folks uh, mentioned this as well. You know, having access to open access is a privileged space already. And one of the concerns that I have or the questions that I think that we can be posing, particularly actually to our, our disciplinary societies is how do we make sure that open access doesn't become a vehicle for uh, giving a megaphone to people who already have a platform? In other words, how do we make sure that um, open access doesn't just make the, the voices from the global north and from the, the biggest, best funded uh, uh, institutions, how do we make sure that those voices don't crowd out uh, all of the voices from 
uh, either less well-resourced well um, institutions within the US and certainly um, abroad and in the global South. Um, because for me, you know, one of the promises of, of open access is that it can make more information available. It can make more information discoverable. Um, but if we're only discovering ourselves, then we're, that kind of defeats the purpose of the academic enterprise. And so how can we think through, um, and again, I, I would put this at the feet of our disciplinary societies um, to um, uh, allow our colleagues um, uh, to leverage the possibilities of uh, open access so that their voices are not drowned out um, by people in the global north. Thank you, Harmony. I'm going to try to kind of seam together a couple of the questions that have popped up in our chat, which is rich with some really thoughtful questions. But um, touching both on the how to pay for this, a few of the panelists have mentioned working with their libraries to um, do some form of open access publishing. Um, so some of us in libraries are thinking, OK, it makes sense. Uh, are we going to start shifting library expenditures from buying things to supporting more open infrastructure? So it'd be interesting to hear um, thoughts about the trade-offs there. Um, but back to this, also on this question about um, sort of inequities in the landscape, uh, obviously for scholars who are working at institutions where neither the institution in, or, nor the library have the resources to really support this, um, this is Angie's question, what might the panel advise for addressing the inequities in the open landscapes across institutions and in turn their own disciplines? I mean, money is where the rubber meets the road, right? Like, I, I think it's such an important question and and it is the $64,000 question, who, like, what are the funding models? What can support? Um, one of the things that I see is that, that there's, a, there's a difficulty of like, are we planning long-term or short-term? You know, universities are all about infrastructure, let's put the thing in place. Um, but a lot of the cultural forces that we're contending with are short-term, they're disruptive and whatever. And so what are, so in addition to kind of the monetary um, aspect, there's also like, what are the cultural logics at play that we can kind of feed into or feed off of? Um, because we might be able to come to a financial solution, but then the game will change and <laughs> then that, that erases. Um, but based on this conversation, you know, one of the things that I've been interested in is the partnerships that OpenAI and other, um, other uh, companies that are engaged in machine learning um, uh, products uh, is, the, is the collaborations and partnerships that they're forming. And I'm not here to like pimp out the universities to capitalism, um, but it is also the case that if content is being utilized to improve uh, tools and resources that are being commercialized, um, where are the content producers in that in that equation? Um, so that would be like a really interesting and, and fun um, thought experiment and opportunity um, because other other like there's also not just like, oh, well, let's just throw up our hands. There's not a solution because there's nobody to pay for it. But it's also the case that, you know, as I was saying earlier, that individual like individuals, we as individual researchers and even we as individual institutions or individual departments shouldn't be bearing all of the cost. Yeah, I think I would add to that to say, and here I'm going to get full like hippie radical utopian about it, but if we took all of the money that we know that university libraries are paying to get access to journals from publishers and instead directed 100% of that amount of money into supporting open access journals that are being run out of the libraries, well then no other library would have to buy journal subscriptions because all of the journals would be free, right? If we reoriented not, you know, the way that that money is spent, it's not that, oh, there isn't money to make journals open access. It's that the money we have is not directed to venues or avenues that would support open access publishing to necessarily the degree that we would want it to. Um, 
the money is there, but again, that would require a rethinking of what is the role of the libraries, right? When uh, and and there are tons of questions about um, kind of uh, technical competency there, right? The libraries are not necessarily uh, currently investing resources in people who would, you know do the like back end uh, of of how you know uh, there's we use OJS for bats, which is good enough, but has its issues, right? And so, you know, libraries are not necessarily investing in the development of better infrastructures for manuscript submission and things like that, but the money is there. Um, it's just that there isn't money there in addition to what it's currently being spent on and getting everyone to kind of coordinate around that reprioritization would be very difficult, but, you know, I'll allow myself to dream momentarily. And I think that that would do uh, a lot to increase the equity of access, not just to authors, but also to readers transnationally and so on. So TJ, while we have you talking, I think Beth has asked an interesting question um, with the disclaimer that they're a catalog librarian, but pointing out that um, there are very few entries for the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies in WorldCat you know, sort of the um, the, the shared common uh, catalog, and it should have hundreds. So I think this is going at some of the discovery questions. Note that catalogers can code the URL fields of the catalog records as OA, and WorldCat will dis will display them. This may be um, as much a comment for our audience as it is a question to our panelists. Um, but since discovery did come up, I'm curious to hear if any of you wanted to comment further about in addition to the reputation gap about you know where where the journal is coming from, who's hosting it, who produced it, do people know it exists? What what kinds of things are you seeing in that space? Well, first of all, Beth, thank you uh, because I am now going to go have a conversation with Northwestern librarians about something that I don't fully understand, but I know that they will. Um, but one of the things that that we had to do in in launching the journal um, uh, was exactly that, making sure that people knew that this journal now existed and that relied a lot on, you know, the fact that the Center for Applied Transgender Studies had a mailing list with thousands of people on it. And other than that, which is like making our editorial board proselytize uh, to a degree that I'm sure many of us lost friends in the process um, from how often we spoke about this new journal. But um, I, I think that that is one of the Kind of infrastructural capacities that I was talking about, maybe us not having that, you know, the for profit and even bigger university press publishers do, which is marketing apparatuses. Um, and that is something that I think about um, a lot because, um, you know, as a relatively new journal, we've only just put out our first volume last year. Like our, our biggest question and concern is like, what does it take to build up that kind of awareness and knowledge. And one of our ways of doing that was, you know, we tried to get articles about the launch of the journal published in places like Times Higher Ed and stuff like that um, with decent success, but that's not necessarily an answer. Um, and so uh, that's something I think about a lot and don't necessarily have intelligent thoughts to share on it other than it keeps me up at night. I'll just add in that for me coming from a small field and others coming from small fields or subfields, discoverability is is huge. Um, you know, people are not going to go look for a dance thing like that's not going to come. That's not top of mind for most people like people think, oh, dance. Yeah, it's pretty, but they don't think a lot, which is absolutely not true. And so being in an open access space where some of the, the research is actually more discoverable. Uh, makes it available to people who, you know, makes it more in, available for interdisciplinary research and makes it more available to researchers outside the discipline who wouldn't think, oh, yes, I need to go check out what um, what the dance folks think about, I don't know, the body or movement or things that they actually have expertise in, but I forget um, because I'm trained in English or I'm trained in history or, you know, I'm, I'm cued into different um, conversation. So I think that uh, OA it has been huge for discoverability. Thank you. And I think 
Um, maybe we've got time for just one uh, one last thought provoking question. And I'll before I turn to Emma's question, I just wanted to throw out um, say thank you to TJ for for throwing out the radical idea there. Um, personally, I would love nothing more than to do that, but I think the scientists would make sure I got fired if I <laughs> didn't continue to provide access. So just uh, just reflecting, I think back what you have all noted that the that it's a the, the conversation about what does the academy value and how do um, scholarly societies function here is so critical. Um, and I think this this notion of collective access to improve you know, the platforms that we use is so important. A big shout out to the University of Michigan for um, granting its university press a couple million dollars, I think making a pretty significant in the millions of dollars commitment to support ongoing open access. Um, the libraries of the Big Ten and the presses of the Big Ten are collaborating right now around open access and um, we've, there's already been things shared through some of these convenings about that, but um, uh, Emma, who I know has, um, work, has worked in the journal, pub, journal and other open publishing in the library at University of Minnesota, has a good question in here about the um, professional societies. So what are you seeing there? Do you see those conversations advancing? Do, do you think the societies need more resources in order to have full conversations about open access? Um, so I'll just speak to my knowledge of some uh, disciplinary specific societies as opposed to uh, societies that are interdisciplinary like ACLS and, and that. I think that they all do need more resources, right? There's, there's not a lot of capacity and honestly, you know, some of the, particularly the buzz around digital humanities, that, that there's so many kind of questions about that rubric, which grew up a number of years, any number of years ago now, right? And, and so one thing I think we need to collectively think about is, is this a transitional phase, right? In other words, do we see open access as the future? And I think a lot of people do. And if so, if the if this is a transitional phase, I mean, what are the short-term and long-term implications. Um, so I think in my experience, there's a lot of um, excitement and, and uh, even more resources available for the short term, right? So if we decided that there's going to be a big push of some kind uh, for certain kinds of things to happen, we can probably make that happen. A lot of people, I think, including people in administration are more leery about long-term commitments, right? So, so saying, okay, I'm gonna commit $100,000 for the next three years is one thing. I'm gonna commit $100,000 in perpetuity uh, or for the next 10 years uh, may feel like a little bit more. So I think some of it is a sort of strategic move, right? I, I appreciate, Claire, your, your sense that in some ways, we we may get fired if we decide to revamp everything and and i i but but i think in some ways it, it is a question of are we creating are we creating a new infrastructure in which case we want to kind of look at what we already have right and we don't necessarily want to throw all of it out either right that there's a lot of reasons why certain kinds of traditional access have been things that we don't necessarily want to give up and i i'm even talking about print books, right, or access to archives that have material objects in them, right? Those things are not things that we can duplicate in a digitized way. I mean, even if we can provide more digital access to certain objects, we can't really change that archival experience, right? So so I, I feel like in some ways we do need to kind of think about um, long-term and short-term, where are we moving to, you know, what's the eventual long-term goal? And then are there short-term projects that really will help really make a difference, right, in, in this space? Um, so I'll just offer that. Um, I think that professional societies are extremely powerful in setting the norms of the field. And so if a field, if a society acknowledges and promotes open access, then it's kind of this trickle down thing. And so there is a kind of winning over hearts and minds that I think needs to happen. 
with our with our societies. Um, you know, just thinking about the conferences that I go to, there are always workshops for like how to get your article published or how to publish your book and the panel of the um, um, the you know press representatives and that kind of thing. But there's actually never a conversation about open access. Um, and there aren't representatives of open access journals. Um, and so I, I think almost even before we get to the place of uh, <laughs> support, which I think actually, yes, we need, uh, we also need to have the conversation. Uh, and so this is also, you know, participating in this panel has given me a charge to go back to my professional organizations to make sure that, that open access is part of the conversation so that it is valued. Um, I know, Josephine, you just mentioned the digital humanities, and I know that I think it's MLA recently published. Um, I want to say it was Rupika Rism and some other folks got together for like putting together a module on how to evaluate digital humanities research. And I think that something uh, along those lines for, for OA would also be really valuable um, in the language of our disciplines. Um, so I'm I'm definitely taking that as, as a charge with me from from this conversation. Thank you, and I would just toss in too, based on the experience colleagues have had um, trying to work on open access initiatives with some scholarly societies, how important the professional staff at those societies are, um, and how much they can be um, either a barrier or or an enabler. So in addition to obviously the scholars themselves. Um, it's the staff who are often most concerned about the bottom line and may be in a position to be negotiating with or renegotiating terms with the publisher. Um, I hate to stop here because I feel like we've really just gotten started, but we are just about out of time. So I'm going to wrap things up and I really want to thank our wonderful panel, all of you for, for being with us um, and to everyone who was able to come on the session. Thank you so much for being here. We hope this will inspire some follow-up conversations in libraries and at your institutions and across the Big Ten Academic Alliance. So after this session, we're going to open an online community conversation in wind tunneling, uh, the platform wind tunneling, which will be based on these same questions. All of you are going to be invited to join the discussion there to see what others are saying and to add your thoughts and ideas. So everyone who participated today will receive a follow-up email and uh, with instructions about how to join the wind tunnel. And then we'll also get that information posted on the BTAA website. Please feel free to share this information with your colleagues if they would like to join in. The ideas contributed to this forum will help build a knowledge bank for community thinking and community conversation, which will become part of our thinking and action in this space. So this forum will be open over the next couple of weeks and we invite and welcome your participation. Our next big convening session will be on March 13th at 10 Central, 11 Eastern. Please plan to join us for an exciting session where we'll take a closer look at the current progress and what's coming as we bring the concept for the big collection, quote unquote, down off the whiteboard and take a close, closer look at what we're building. So we'll be in touch with further details about that. Um, I just wanna thank again, our wonderful panelists. Holly had to leave a little early to make another meeting, but huge thanks to, to Josephine, TJ and Harmony for being with us today. Uh, we so appreciate having a chance to talk with you and to hear your thoughts and um, how this is affecting your work and your scholarship. So to all of you who are participants, when you leave Zoom, you'll get a very brief survey about your experience of the session today. If you would, please just take a minute to fill it out. It, we really appreciate the input and it will help us plan and strengthen our future sessions. Have a great day. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.